about uh, design of scientific software a little bit before we get back into a little more about testing. So, um, you know, we've had this experience uh, over the last few decades that I talked about in the overview where we've gotten into a virtuous cycle. Oops, I should turn on my camera. Um, gotten into a virtuous cycle and we're, you know, we're doing better science, better computational science, which also generates the desire for uh, even more improvement. And um, we've combined this with um, a situation where we're now starting to see uh, a big increase in the platform complexity in recent years. So we went through 20 plus years where a fairly simple by today's terms distributed memory model for your uh, computer and your software worked pretty effectively. Uh, but now we have all these heterogeneous processors and things like that that we have to deal with. So things have gotten a lot more complex. And of course, uh, once again, any component in the software system may be uh, a, the object of research. The software is continuously evolving. And in um, a scientific setting, pretty much any time you do major production runs with the software, it's a different and unique case. So you know, you're, you're stressing the code in different ways and things like that. And so we come up with uh, a number of general principles that might help guide the design of scientific software in this kind of setting. Uh, so first of all, we're dealing these days with multidisciplinary teams. There are many different facets of knowledge and it's not possible for everybody to know everything. So uh, a design strategy to help deal with that is called separation of concerns. So encapsulate certain kinds of knowledge, certain kinds of functionality in different sections of the code uh, so that you can shield developers from unnecessary interactions with uh, things that they don't need to understand. If you, if you encapsulate things and put good interfaces around them, then people should only have to deal with the interfaces. And as long as those are well documented, uh, and, and well tested, uh, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, another consideration is really you wanna think in terms of a couple different types of, uh, well, paces of change in your code. One is the infrastructure that's relatively set. It doesn't need to change very much uh, and you can largely rely on it. And the other is the uh, more rapidly changing scientific models, numerical methods and things like that, which is where most of the development is happening. And the design strategy here is to explicitly separate your code so that you have these two segments um, so that you can easily distinguish what's, what's long lived code versus what is sort of quickly changing and may be thrown away pretty quickly or, or may evolve very quickly. And then, um, the, the third consideration is that codes grow. We get new ideas, which turn into new features in the code. Uh, we really want code to be reused by others, and that often uh, happens in ways that we don't anticipate. So you can try to design with extensibility in mind. You wanna make it easy to add new capabilities. You wanna make it easy to customize existing capabilities to facilitate these things. So uh, a couple of general um, principles to, to think about, as I alluded to in the previous slide, um, really separate your code into a couple uh, distinct chunks, right? So in the top left, we have, um, you know, the parts of your code that are really the most often the focus of your, your research, that's the models you're implementing and the numerical aspects of those models. Uh, and, and there will be um, client code associated with this that's numerically, uh, that's mathematically complex um, and that will need to change in response to what's going on um, in, on this first block, right? But then there are other aspects of the code that are more stable. So once you've settled on a mess, mesh discretization technique. You probably don't need to worry about that too much. Your IO, dealing with runtime parameters, uh, things like that. Um, you know, those, those aren't big, um, frequently changing things. You have other infrastructure. A lot of your data structures 
and, and data movement patterns and things like that can be pretty well defined and you can uh, implement them and you don't need to worry about changing them very often. So um, you can separate your code this way and you can apply all these concepts that are uh, kind of repeat what we talked about before, um, separate the concerns so that you have uh, code that's well separated functionality uh, functionally um, encode especially the more stable the infrastructure components into a framework define the interfaces carefully uh, and document them well and also differentiate between what's protected or what's private in a code and what's exposed to the public and expose to the public to other pieces of code that is uh, as little as you can get away with right so keep keep as much inside the code so that people who just want to use the code don't have to worry about how the code is implemented um, and lastly you should think uh, today we hear a lot about different programming models especially for accelerators and things like that but your best strategy is to first do the design without consideration of the programming model and then apply the programming model um, afterwards. Okay, if you, if you design to a particular programming model, you're gonna be whipped around the next time you, you need to modify to a different programming model, you need to move to a different machine, you're gonna have challenges and they're gonna be harder than if you uh, tried to work with a design that was intended to be agnostic with respect to the programming model. It's not to say that the programming model won't have impacts, but we, we try to put them later on at a lower level in the development activity. So this slide shows kind of a, a straightforward uh, graph or, or flowchart of um, how you can think about these things. On the left side, we have the infrastructure components of the system. And on the right side, we have the sort of science capabilities, the model, uh, things like that, that are more rapidly changing. And so on the infrastructure side, you wanna think in terms of requirements, what does the science that you're doing require out of a stable infrastructure, design the API, implement it, test it uh, and maintain it. And then as you're going on with the science on the right side, um, you're modifying the model, you have to code to the API for the infrastructure. Um, you do um, design work on the science side, you do development, you validate it. Um, and you, you integrate, you test these things out, you integrate them into the code. You may find along the way that you need some changes in the infrastructure. If you do, then you may need to augment the infrastructure at which point you come back around to modifying the API, you implement the changes, you test those carefully and go back around. But you do it in a very thoughtful, controlled way so that you're not changing the infrastructure um, unnecessarily while the capabilities, the science capabilities are free to change more often. So let's think about this in terms of a simple example. We've already been referring to this little uh, heat equation example. This is actually the physical problem we're trying to deal with. Suppose that you've got a pipe in a wall in your house outside. It's supposed to get really cold overnight inside. It's uh, nice and cozy warm. Uh, when do you have to worry about the water pipe freezing? So this is the, the heat equation example we've been referring to. So, um, <clears throat> How to think of this from a design specification? Well, or a design perspective. So first of all, what are the specifications? We have the heat equation. We have some initial conditions and some boundary conditions. And I didn't tell you this in the original question, but we want, because we're going to uh, experiment with the numerics, we wanna be able to easily apply some different integration methods to this problem. So what is the infrastructure here? Well, we can discretize things. We need to have a way of verifying things. There's some simple IO that's needed. We have to you know, report some results. We have to apply the initial conditions. We have to get the runtime parameters, et cetera. What's the, what's the model? Well, we have, um, we have this set of initial conditions. We have some boundary conditions we have to apply and we have to integrate the equation through time. So what might, um, and your infrastructure API look like? Well, we might have something to process the arguments so that we can um, get all the, you know, control the simulation 
we have a way to initialize things. We need to be able to copy some data. We need to be able to write an array. And we need a way of setting the initial conditions. So these are generic infrastructure in this case. It's a simple problem. So the infrastructure is pretty straightforward. Then the numerics. Well, we, we want to be able to take a norm to measure um, how big our error is. We have several different solutions that we want to try out, a Crank-Nicholson method, an upwind method, um, this FTCS method, and then we have a way of computing the exact solution for comparison purposes. So we have two separate sets of APIs, uh, and we can put those together. But that's a very simple problem. So now let's think about um, a more complex, more realistic problem. You have some multi-physics simulation that involves partial differential equations. How do these concepts map into that kind of situation? <clears throat> well, um, basically, we do a, a couple of things in uh, today's computing environment. We, take, we, we think about the domain that we're going to be doing this computation on right now. Let's think of it as the square. Uh, and because we have a um, fundamentally distributed processor system, we need to do a spatial decomposition to put, that, uh, to put pieces of that problem on different processors. Um, and what that's going to give us is really a bunch of independent computational units on each processors that may need to exchange uh, boundary condition information between the processors. This is a fairly straightforward uh, uh, view of domain decomposition that probably most of you are used to. And if we, if we follow something like this, then the considerations on this side of things become you know, the parallelization and the scaling of that data exchange and, and how to implement that efficiently. Uh, and then the other perspective is what's happening within each of the blocks. That's the functional decomposition. So here you have, um, you know, the math that's going on in each of those, these little domains. And you can view this math as a, a collection of, of components. And for these, since they're localized, their operation is localized, your primary, um, uh, uh, focus areas here are on the memory access patterns and optimizing uh, the compute so that you're doing that efficiently. And these are things that you can farm out to different people. So from the math perspective, implementing the, the functional aspects of the calculation, you probably want to engage some domain experts and some applied method mathematicians, but a lot of these optimization activities uh, can be done by your software and performance engineering colleagues. Uh, and so now we have a way of looking at this that has some infrastructure uh, that handles the domain decomposition and some of the math and, and implementing the model and things like that. Um, you can take this into uh, a particular example. This is from the Flash code, which is now called Flash X. They have an approach that has uh, components that, you know, you can see just a few examples of the, you know, several dozen components that are available in the Flash environment. They have uh, an API to deal with grids. They have an API for um, uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Then they have one for hydrodynamics and and different uh, variations on that. And they basically have a, a configuration approach that they can just configure these, um, these things to plug together uh, based on their interfaces uh, and interact with each other. And so they've got a, a whole setup here that allows the creation of a wide variety of uh, very capable high-performance multi-physics simulations just by thinking carefully about this design that gives them all the, the separation into different types of components with well-defined interfaces and some tools that they've developed to, to help uh, put them together in the way that they want for one simulation or another. Okay, so this is um, all very good. This is mostly focused on the distributed memory model, which uh, we know is really um, kind of back in history. It's still part of the machines that we field today, but something else has taken over a lot. Um, but the takeaways so far are you need to differentiate between the slow and the fast changing components. You need to understand the requirements 
on your infrastructure and implement a careful separation of concerns. Think about uh, portability and extensibility and maintainability and don't design with a particular programming model in mind. And now you come to today where we've got all these different heterogeneous programming environments and, and computers that we have to worry about. And so do these design principles change? The answer is not really. The details get more involved, but the fundamental principles still apply. Um, and so we go back to this, um, this flowchart and the areas that are highlighted in purple are the, the sort of the contact points where the changes are most likely to interact with each other, right? So you may have to, to accommodate things like GPU accelerators and things like that. You, uh, you are going to have to change things and you wanna think about them in an isolated fashion, right? So that the, uh, these contact points are where you're focusing the uh, changes that need to happen. So uh, based on experience, we've developed some principles that can guide uh, design in this new uh, heterogeneous type of environment. First of all, you should focus on hierarchical parallelism, several levels of parallelism. Uh, so decompose to the nodes, decompose within the nodes, um, design towards several thousand threads of computation, expect a hierarchical memory space. That means you may need to think about the uh, data moving between memory spaces and that has a cost associated with it. And so you wanna include um, in your design the capability to be careful about which memory space you're in and be thoughtful about the need to move between memory spaces, be able to reuse memory and things like that. Uh, and all throughout this, you really want to avoid uh, uh, vendor specific options. That can be hard, especially with some of the less um, mature programming environments that are um, uh, tend to start out as vendor focused uh, you know, responses but um, it is, it's something to be thoughtful about. And if you're careful, you can do this. So the, the, the kind of design considerations that we talked about before are still active, but we need to uh, sort of generalize a little bit. So we need to start thinking, you know, in terms of the domain decomposition, you may need to be um, introduce some designs to deal with the load distribution. Uh, more carefully and management of the runtime so that you can pick up tasks and, and run them. Um, and then on the functional decomposition side, you may, for example, start invoking some code transformations or alternate versions of code to accommodate different types of processor capabilities uh, on the node. But a lot of the considerations are, are still the same. So fundamentally, when you get into this new, more heterogeneous environment, um, some of the big things to think about are, um, you know, the, the structure of the data that will be effective on these uh, with the new memory hierarchies and the new processor types that you're trying to worry about and how to map the algorithms that you're using onto these devices, worry about the data movement um, so that you're not doing excess data movement that can be more expensive than the actual computations. Uh, and so fundamentally, the uh, performance you end up with is uh, based on how well you, you think through this and do the mapping from your algorithm uh, to the hardware. Some of the underlying ideas, um, try to make the same code work on different devices. There's a variety of ways to do this, but um, if fundamentally, if you can let the compiler do it, um, or you may have to provide uh, specializations for the, the hardware. Um, you may have heard of tools like Cocos and Raja and other uh, what are called template metaprogramming abstraction layers that help provide some, some tools to uh, do this more easily. There's a variety of ways you can do this with if defs in the code and things like that as well. Um, and then you need to assign the work to the node and think about the data movement that's uh, happening within the different processors and the different memories within the node. Um, and you want to think about the platforms that you're trying to support and design for the commonalities that you see across the machines, not the distinctive features. Um, and so even when you're using 
these third party tools like Cocos or Raja or other things, you need to understand uh, sort of what they're doing and something about how they're accomplishing their work so that you can use them effectively. So it's it's not, um, you can't treat these, afford to treat these things as a complete black box. You do need to, to give them, uh, have some understanding of what's going on. And so the final takeaways here, um, so you wanna think about um, performance portability and longevity of your software. Um, and the best way to do that is to be thoughtful about the design of your software. So you should build extensibility into the design of your software. You should uh, focus on being independent of any specific programming model with the idea that you may need to move around and implement the um, code in multiple programming models over its lifetime. Uh, and think about uh, composability and flexibility as a, a means to achieve your design. Uh, so there are a bunch of resources uh, that are associated with some of the things that I've talked about here and be happy to answer any questions if you wanna put those in the chat and I'll hand back over to Rinku. Uh, 